All right, and we are recording. So Professor Lee Cronin, thank you so much for, for joining. It's a pleasure to be with you. I appreciate it. I know that you, you said you're jet lagged flying uh, back from the US to the UK. What were you doing in, uh, in the US? I was at a workshop and then um, in the Beyond Center um, at, at the ASU. And then I was talking to some uh, collaborators um, investors and also uh, tried to catch the eclipse on the way back, which was awesome. uh, which was fun. Awesome. And I'll, I'll ask more about that. But for those who don't know, Lee Cronin is a professor of chemistry at the University of Glasgow, where Lee, you, you lead a research group focused on complex chemical systems and the origins of life. <clears throat> uh, Lee holds a PhD in chemistry from the University of Edinburgh and is received a lot of awards and honors for contributions to the field of chemistry, uh, which includes being elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and the Royal Society of Chemistry. Uh, Lee, your research has been widely published in top scientific journals and you're, you're, you're really recognized as a leading figure at the intersection of chemistry, biology, and origins of life. Um, what did I miss? Um, so I guess, I mean, I'm trying not to be an origin of life person. Um, and my PhD is from York actually, although I'm sure Edinburgh would love to put me on their books. I did do, I did do a postdoc oh. in Edinburgh. So I'm glad I, I'm glad I asked, I'm glad I clarified my, my mistake. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. Um, and, and so I'm kind of more interested, well, I'm not, I am interested in the origin of life, but I think that the, the process that gives rise to life is, is going on today. And I'm really interested in quantifying that. It's a bit like saying um, I'm interested in, you know, in the origin of the sun. Sure, I mean, but I'm also interested in the origin of stars. By that analogy, you see what I mean. So I'm, I'm yeah. interested in the process that gives rise to biology in the universe. I think it's super simple, um, the the mechanism, but obviously it it, it creates incredible complexity. And like everything that's around us has come from life, right? Um, so yeah. that's kind of a, a yeah a, a, a big thing. It's like you know, it's literally the ultimate. Why are we here? Right. And why is that? What What have you found? Um, I think that it's there's 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 three critical points. Um, the first thing is that we have to understand that existence is much more um, profound than we first thought, or persistence. And, and that's persistence of objects that could ordinarily die or cease to exist, right? So that's a, that, that's a very important, that the ability to exist is, is not a given. And, and, I'm, and I mean, if your half-life is short, I mean, if you're a rock, you could exist for four or five billion years, but if you're an organic molecule or some kind of fragile collection, your existence is not a given. So life is literally the fight for existence. Um, that's the first point, I guess. And then the second point is the realization of the universe um, is incredibly large in combinatorial space, much larger than it is in physical space. And so the things that actually do exist are super special. So you've got this thing of persistence over time. There's combinatorial space of things that, that could exist that don't all exist and then there is this process which is which is selection which basically enables um life if you like to fight the battle of decay and um death into non-existence and once you start to understand it in that framing it becomes super easy um and that you know, one of the things I think is very hard for us to understand is that the oldest living thing we know on Earth, other than the physical planet, and the and the kind of is actually life. Like, life on Earth is 4.2, 4.3 billion years old. You know, the, that that's the technology that goes with life is is really ancient. In what, what I, as a scientist, you know, a lot of scientists don't have the the popularity that you do what what made you so popular and what brought you into this popularity i wouldn't say i'm popular i would say huh yeah <laughs> um, 
<laughs> right now, I don't feel very popular. Um, but sure, I mean, I have a, I, I, I've made a point of. Uh, so what makes? Uh, let me rephrase it. I would guess I try and engage with people across a broad number of disciplines. That's number one. Number two, I try and pick. I try and pick things to do things that when I try and pick them, I try and frame them in in the almost outrageous framing, and then very systematically pick apart why it's possible. You know. What do you mean? What do you mean outrageous framing? Well, you know, going to build going to build a life form in the lab. That's a fairly outrageous statement to make. Or going to make a robot that does any chemical reaction, or makes. Are any you saying the way you're framing the problem is outrageous, or the, the, the yeah frame deciding to tackle is that is it outrageous? Well, I think all of it. I think that at the space of it, some of these problems seem outrageous and intractable. So and then say so. I like to say categorize things broadly and then chop them down, explain how they work. I think that gets quite a lot of engagement. That's quite good. Um, because you tackle bigger, more interesting problems, you and then you don't go, you don't start with the minutia. You start with the big problem and then get into the minutia. Yeah, big. I mean, big. I like to, the, you know, problems are important in science. That's all we do, right? Solve problems. The bigger the problem, the better. And I think lots of people are maybe not are a bit too, not too timid. Maybe that's the wrong word. It quite can be quite overwhelmed with the enormity of solving a big problem. Uh, and I think if you want to get people behind you and you want to get funding and you also want to change the way people think, um, I think I'm in that position as a chemist, right? Lots of chemists are kind of, they're undervalued in that chemist, you know, curing disease, uh, making agriculture work, making new, uh, um, you know, materials. And so that chemists typically don't get to express themselves in such kind of big ways. I mean, I think one of the things that was kind of interesting with the assembly theory paper is I was criticized for being ambitious. I was like, what on earth is that? I mean, it, it, you know, either, either finding the, the origin of life and finding a mechanism that gives rise to life um, is possible or is not. Like saying it was too ambitious was really weird. It was one of the weirdest criticisms I got. So, so I think that people appreciate the ambition and the, the and I try and be, I try and modestly do it. It's not like, I mean, I think Elon Musk can get away with saying we're going to go to Mars and that's quite ambitious. But actually, if you look at Starship, People like, if you look at it now, you go, oh, yeah, maybe that's possible. Uh, so I, I think that's probably one of the reasons is that I, um, I can very happen to enter into critical discussion about ambitious things because I want to try and solve it. I want to solve what life is. That just happens to require quite complete reframing of our physics and chemistry, I would argue. Lots of people make makes them angry. They think the physics, chemistry, and biology are just fine the way they are. I think they're not. I think you cannot the, the current the current standard model of physics, chemistry, and biology, and not sufficient to explain life, which is a problem. Is that where assembly theory comes in? What part of it? Yeah, I think assembly theory just grew out of first of all, uh, kind of trying to tell the difference between life and non-life, and I realized it's much bigger than that. And I think, and then. I was try I spent lots of time trying to understand the problems in physics, problems in chemistry, and problems in biology. So I think as a chemist, I can I, I'm pretty my understanding the problems there. I started there and I wanted to make sure I wasn't, you know, kind of going completely mad. And the problem in chemistry is one of like complexity, right? It's like how how do complex molecules get made, you know. Um, and doing thought experiments about that has allowed us to start to build assembly theory, then looking at biology and saying, how did the cell get formed and how did the components of the cell spontaneously come into existence um, so that evolution can occur? So you've got the impossibility of the cell, the understanding of complexity in chemistry, and then how does physics give rise to complex chemistry and gives rise to evolution? And the fact that all three disciplines basically just kind of ignored the question. Biology just says, well, if evolution works, what are you talking about? There's no problem. So I was like, but where? In chemistry, chemistry. Who says that? Who, who asked that question? Um, 
I, so I don't want to put words in their mouth because I'm not completely sure that everyone thinks this, but it, it seems to me that a lot of evolutionary biologists seem to think that the origin of life is not a very difficult problem. It's a solved problem. Um, they think it's, I, what do they think the answer is? I, that's it. I, when I asked them, they said, well, evolution, it just, did, you know, the cell. And, and they think that prebiotic chemistry has solved that. And then when you get prebiotic chemistry, they're like, no, no, we haven't solved that. <laughs> and you get, and, and the phys physics says there's initial conditions. And it's, it's all a bit confused, to be honest, is that people have not, people in one camp have not really thought about the problem in other camps, right? There are a number of problems that have to be solved. I guess I would argue that the origin of life and understanding life is a problem that can only be solved from a point of view of chemistry, uh, biology, physics, some understanding of uh, of computer science, probably even economics, uh, and uh, that's weird. And and what is your answer? What is my answer? Well, I'm working on it. I think the answer is that um, the the process of selection uh, cre creates complexity. And selection creates object, uh, objects of complexity uh, that exist and compete to exist. And that competition to exist allows um, the system to basically produce more and more um, internal knowledge to survive in the environment. But occasionally those, the, those systems will get killed because they're not resistant to the environment. And so you had the pro so you you got towards this key milestone, I would say, for life on Earth, which is the cell, with the ribosome in it and all that technology in the modern tech context, and that was the first starting point. So you had this transition to cells. That's really a big mystery of the precise mechanistic details. I think we know how to do it now, or at least how to do experiments to make progress there. So that's really exciting. And then when you have the cell. The cell has to get to multicellularity. That took a long time to do that. It's not completely obvious. And then when we got to multicellularity and to animals and to abstraction machines, we got to life forms that produce technology. So you've got these kind of transitions along the way. At the moment, I'm still focused on the you know, physics, chemistry to biology transition through this fact that you need to just explore a big chemical space but it would appear that the mechanism is very, very simple. It is a way of objects undergoing, um, um, a, well, I can actually give you, so the way it would happen is you can imagine very simple molecules interacting. Um, those molecules would come together under chance and produce more complex molecules. And then when that soup, molecules or collections of molecules that can act, that can, causally enable their own production start to win. So what does that mean? So a molecule or set of molecules that can cause, that can act on the environment to cause more of them to be made, then starts to take the resources in the environment towards these molecules so they can exist. Now, of course, there's, not, there's lots of other comp molecules out there, trillions, countless trillions, and they can do the same. And then you have this, this kind of speciation or competition. Now, speciation means something very specific in biology. In here, we just call it different proto-species of networks. And then they would then um, only be, I get so far in sophistication about building genetic machinery, cellular machinery, the organelles, because at the end, you get this thing called a cell. And what can a cell do? Well, the bacterial cell, at least, can exist lots of places on Earth autonomously. It can take uh, nutrients from the environment, it can take light from the sun, and it can replicate. And that was like that technology gave biology a universal kind of reach through Darwinian evolution. So that's a major transition that we want to try and get to. Now, will we get anywhere near approaching that in a laboratory? I don't think it, it's probable that you can do it unaided, but you'll be able to show how to get there because there's a lot of time. Because Earth, you know, life used planet Earth and 100 million years. So, um, but
But I think it's really, it's not trivial to show, but now people know how gravity works, right? And no one has made a star on the planet. We're trying refusion and you can see that gravity, that hydrogen would clump up and at some point as it gets hot, the hydrogen would ignite. So I wanna show the same type of process in chemistry producing complexity from nothing. So if we can start to search, so simple molecules plus time, heterogeneity can give us increasing complexity and quantify that, then we know we're on the, the right path. Assembly theory, which you mentioned a moment ago, is a way of doing it, as, is like the instrumentation and uh, required to actually see that. And I can talk about that if you want. Yeah, how would you describe assembly theory for the layman? Yeah, so very simply, assembly theory um, explains how um, causation can uh, can be quantified, and and causation that gives you selection and evolution. And these are quite grand terms. That if not caught, that 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 kind of get me into well, they get me into trouble at all. They're selection, and evolution. I mean, what is it? You know. Um, um, and it came out of this me realizing I could see molecules in the environment that seemed complex, but I wanted to understand how they got there. So assembly theory allows you to capture that. So if I just gave you a bag of objects, I read, you know, some I found, you'd be able to use assembly theory via the assembly equation to estimate how, how much assembly is associated with those objects. And then you could then basically benchmark that against an abiotic or a biological system or a technological system. How you do that? Take your bag of objects, you cut up each object and you look at the- say, what, what does it mean object? What does that mean? Um, an object is literally a discrete thing. I mean, in this case, ob the term object is evolving all the time, but in chemical space, just molecules. And this, we'll just look at bag of molecules and- Why not, why not, say, why not say molecule instead of object? Sorry? Why not say molecule instead of object? Oh, good point. Well, as in for chemistry, the object are molecules. But then as, as chemistry becomes more complicated, the objects become networks. And then those things become complex. The, the, the objects become cells. And those become more complex. The cells become tissues and differentiate and then animals. And then they become more complex. You have these layers of different assemblies of objects and you get into technology and even language and mathematics. But at the base, you could even also go lower down to the fundamental particles as objects. But I think then you have to use all sorts of sophisticated machinery. But in for the chemist, sure, um, you can use small uh, molecules, even small polymers, but it's very important to define it correctly so the chemist knows what they're analyzing. And what, what has assembly theory uh, gotten us as far as knowledge about the world? What, in um, other words, what have, what have you discovered or at least hypothesized about life and about evolution as a result of assembly theory? Well, using the assembly equation, which is a really simple term, where basically you've got this term A, which is the amount of assembly, is a function of um, the complexity of an object and the number of identical objects. This is really important. So if you can if you can find a lot of identical objects and they're simple, that's fine. No selection here. For the more complex the objects and the more of them you find, the more weird that is. And what we've been able to, or, or more evidence of selection. And what we've been able to do in the lab is show that biological systems are uniquely able to produce high complexity, high abundance objects. And that kind of realization flips you from one, oh, I'm just looking at complexity of an object, one object. Um, it could be a one-off, it could be magic, it could be made by you know a, a creator, it could be made by evolution, but you can't tell the difference. But the more of those objects you can count, the more certain you are. And what assembly theory has allowed us to do is put limits on that and, and also start to understand how we can search for complexity where there is none in the lab. So we can look for mechanisms of selection operating and we can look at biologic, biological samples and assess um, how, how much 
diversity is there. And also we can build a system that just literally is able to tell us the difference between life and non-life. And that has been a critical uh, kind of driver for assembly theory at the beginning. You know, that was really, I just wanted to answer the question, how is it that this molecule looks like it can't form without biology? And all the chemists are like, sure it can form, it can happen randomly. And then when I did the counting and showed that that clearly wasn't the case, probabilistically, it allowed us to flip into a new space of measuring selection before Darwinian evolution. And so assembly theory has given us that framework instrumentation. You can now measure something, number one. Number two, it allows you to build new experiments and at least conceptually. Measure something meaning, meaning understand the complexity of uh, an object. Yeah, we now quantify it objectively, right? There's lots of, lots of techniques out there for looking at complexity, but they're not based on objects. They're based on computation. And there's lots of confusion that people use when they com confuse computational complexity and what I would call physical complexity. They are not the same thing. And yeah, go What's on, the difference? Um, it's about the, so there's kind of three really subtle differences. The first one is to, if you want to look at the computational complexity of something, you have to have an algorithm um, and you have to have a computer and you have to be able to, you know, let's say you wanted to compress something, you'd have to be able to use a compression algorithm on a processor. And these are not trivial things, right? So, um, cause you have, to, you have to have the technology and computational complexity was developed over many years um, in a field of what's called algorithmic information theory to literally say, how much resource do I need to solve this mathematical problem? And so it's like, you know, how much memory do I need or how much time? Okay, that's basically it. Whereas biology is not really a computer and it's not really looking at computational resource. And so it's very easy to make a false comparison between the two, but the what happens in biology, biology needs to remember the structures that give rise to the information that allows it to survive in the environment. Whereas those structures in computational complexity are just stored arbitrarily in a memory. And, the, and there's no, the, there's nothing special given to those causal structures. They're just kind of taken as given. And I think that's the major insight of assembly theory is assembly theory you should view with alongside entropy. And I think that basically entropy is like, what is entropy? Entropy is a thing which uh, measures the amount of order. Um, there was, there is the thermodynamic example of entropy with heat. Um, but then Boltzmann came in and made it all about molecules and counting molecules and the number of ways of arranging things. And, you know, you know, the entropy of a perfect crystal at zero, the lowest temperature known is zero. And, and I, what we started to see is that assembly and entropy are really interestingly connected in that assembly tells you about selection and entropy tells you about disorder. And in fact, selection produces disorder as almost like the, 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 the byproduct of selection is entropy. So it's kind God, of cool. So connected. And, and then assembly theory and everything you're talking about really influences the fundamentals of evolution and how we think about evolution. Well, that's what we're hoping. I mean, it's a theory, right? A framework with a free, the theory solves a problem that we haven't yet solved. And I think one of the things is like some of the critics of assembly theory are like, you know, just kind of, kind of um, failing to under, not failing to, you know, failing to understand the problem we're trying to solve and then saying, you know, oh, maybe it's already, this problem's already solved. And that's fine in science is what we You're do. You're trying to solve the problem of understanding these concepts more deeply and not assuming that the puck stops with yeah. just, oh, well, well, chemistry dictates that uh, cells and survival the fittest. Let's leave it there. You're digging deeper to understand deepening layers of causality. I mean, yeah. I mean, assembly theory in the end should give the mechanism of Darwinian evolution. Darwinian, Darwinian evolution is fairly phenomenological. We know it works, right? It's a bit, it, but it gives a bit more underlying mechanics to it. Um, and I think that the problem that assembly theory was set out to solve was, hey, here's two samples. 
Can you find uh, that we've picked? Can you tell the difference? Can you tell if one ha has been produced by life or not? And is the other one just abiotic? That was all it was designed to do. And, it, and it's based on the complexity that is able to answer the question. Is that correct? Yeah, complexity and com combined with abundance. And that critical combination uh, was was uh, made, made a big difference. The second problem it solves is um, starting to give a mechanism. And that mechanism, at least in chemistry, is about molecules um, producing themselves or producing networks that produce themselves. And that mechanism, it, it comes about quite naturally in any complex chemical system. But we need to quantify it. It's okay for me to say, oh, there'll be self-replicators in this goo. Trust me. No, let's measure it. Let's measure it systematically. And that's what we're trying to work on doing at the moment. The third thing it does, which I think I didn't really expect, is it starts to quantify the size of the universe and with respect to the subunits of causation. You've got this universe where everything can be caused all at once and you don't, you're not constrained by the laws of physics. You've got a universe constrained by just the laws of physics and you don't need causation. You can just, everything's accessible. And then you've got a universe where you need causation. And what does that mean? Well, it's like, well, yeah, I need to build, you know, the transistor before I build the CPU. And I need to build, you know, um, this spring before I can build a mechanical keyboard. And there's these orders that things must happen. And then there's the fourth universe, which is the observed, the assembly observed, where we can actually go and go, well, let's actually look for evidence of things. And then we then take those objects and we break them apart mathematically. And we can start to generate the historical space that they've been comprised of. And, and that really was, for me, really powerful. And it's starting to yield, you know, interesting insights from drug discovery to looking for AGI. What types of insights is it yielding? I mean, when you say AGI and the other point, like what are a couple of insights? Well, I mean, like the, the one that is kind of a joke, right? But it's not, I mean, if we're afraid of AGI, let's make an AGI detector. What is an AGI going to do? An AGI is going to be able to produce causal structures that didn't exist before. Um, and so if we can bench, if we can fingerprint what causal structures human beings make, and then we look at, because what human beings do is they produce novelty and what an AGI will be able to do is produce novelty. And assembly theory is a novelty um, quantifier, right? And we're, we're using this right now to explore the space of LLMs. And we think it's relatively trivial to show that LLMs do not produce the same type of novelty that evolution or intelligent beings creating a creative thought gen knowledge generation using creativity to solve problems. I'll say that again. Creative beings that generate knowledge to solve problems. That would be my definition of an AG, of a general intelligence, right? Just for the record. Creative beings that can come up with problems, uh, so come up with knowledge to solve problems, right? Current AI right now does not do that. It does something very different. Assembly theory is good at quantifying that. So one of the things we're doing for fun is just to say, well, let, let's push it to the limit. Can we use assembly theory to quantify novelty and therefore be an AGI detector? Because I think a lot of people would want those. You know, it's like, is Skynet here or not? You know, just have a look. <laughs> does consciousness matter? Like when we think of true AGI, does con is consciousness, does that play a role? Oh, I, I mean, it's so uh, beyond my... Cons my um, ability well i don't think i have the correct equipment for understanding neurobiology psychology consciousness and philosophy but given that i do claim to be a sentient being i do have some skin in the game um but i is consciousness required for problem solving i don't know Kind of cool. Not for problem solving for AGI. I mean, are you defining well, AGI as just as AG, I'm, I'm saying AGI needs to be able to solve problems, right? In a way, it creatively, right? A, like for me, an but that's not the, that's not the, that's not the only requirement for AGI. Um, I'm sure there's a whole plethora of them, right? But what I'm kind of trying, I want to be able to. What is an artificial general intelligence? And I think you know, people watering it down now. Where I have computer science arguing me saying. 
no, 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 an AGI is just going to do everything cognitively better than you. And I'm just like, what does that actually mean? It's like, it's going to, you know, is it going to play chess better than me? Is it going to basically write better than me? Is it going to draw better than me? In these narrow domains where it can gamify them, sure. But um, I would say that we because we don't really concretely know what intelligence is, it's hard to say it's going to be that. But I would argue human beings uniquely are creative to, uh, to solve problems and but in doing so generate new knowledge that is unpredictable. From that point of view, I take a leaf out of David Deutsch's and, and Karl Popper's books, right? That's really, for me, the thing I can see happening. And um, I don't think AGI, uh, I would like, I would like AGI, understand how AG, we could build AGIs to do that. But there's lots of different angles and it causes, it's causing lots of discussion right now, which I think is really productive because I think we're in this kind of illusionary phase of AI. And we're using a huge amount of resource to build these AIs. And we need to understand if we can use less resource and get better results. Use what resource and get better results? Less resource and get better results. I mean, it is not at all astonishing to me that ChatGPT is good, right? Everyone's like, I'm astounded. I'm like, you take 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 parameters and you brute force with literally trillions of kilowatts to form a model, that's, that's actually not hard to imagine. What was hard, what people didn't understand is that scale that would happen. But what you see now is you've got this problem where you're gonna need exponentially more data to linearly scale. And that is very inefficient. The human brain doesn't need exponentially more data, data to become linearly better at it. And I think that's kind of... So what's different about the human brain and how would we replicate that to create AGI without the scale problem? I think the human brain is processing information in a way that we don't yet understand because we have made assumptions about the physics that are not correct. And that's really cool. I mean, what are those, you know, what are those assumptions? Sorry? What are those assumptions that are not correct? Um, we 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 make assumptions about how the brain works in our models right and so is the brain digital you know is it analog is it just an is it just a a, a, a kind of multiple you know neural networks layered together we just don't really know how consciousness and uh, and uh, problem solving manifest in the human brain we have some ideas and neurobiology has come on a lot but there's but no one knows why the brain can uniquely produce novelty. And lots of people would argue indeed that the brain doesn't, it's not the only thing to produce novelty and that current AI is. And I think it's trivial to show that that's not correct, but it's nevertheless quite hard because AI is very fashionable. People are very excited. People would make a lot of money, you know? And so I feel like I'm a bit of like a party pooper. So the doom is going, we're all gonna die. The optimists say, we're just gonna just go to the, AI heaven and I'm in the middle going it's a cool tool but it doesn't really do what you think should we just like should we just recalibrate before we go you know make assumptions because otherwise what, what happens you, is you say it doesn't do what you think what do you mean I mean chat GPT works right so what does chat GPT do chat GPT is a is a is a, if you give it a if you give it a prompt it will give you a response to that prompt and and it could be it could be meaningful or could not be meaningful because it's done probabilistically right chat gpt has no underlying um theory of the world or, or awareness or yeah well it kind of has chat gpt that chat gpt has captured or the model has captured some features of the world and some features of the human awareness that produced the data that went into the model but that's where the that's where it stops so when human beings are being relatively boring chat gpt is quite good but is it better than google i mean it's it's quite good in that you can get it to do some say please write me a letter to you know to my lawyer to explain why i haven't done this and it will do it right and maybe the lawyer can't be bothered to read it and it looks good it's a lot of text it sounds reasonable you've edited it a little bit i mean it's quite good from that point of view it generates you content but is that content new or meaningful or useful i don't know i mean i've played with it a bit and I'm, I don't use ChatGPT every day. Does that make me a Luddite? 
maybe. How do you think we could eventually create AGI or artificial general intelligence? What is missing and what would we have to do to create artificial general intelligence, which is really the notion that there's an AI that has true awareness or consciousness, or at least like holistic uh, thinking and reasoning skills and can check the box of creating novelty. So I, I think there are a couple of things we have to consider. First of all, we do, because we don't know what intelligent is, it is yet, that it's going to be difficult to understand what to do to get there. I think we would, there should be a way to do it, right? And the question is, is the current technology even correct? Is it even in the right category of technology to produce these things? Um, what I would be interested in doing, and it's not sidestepping the question, is to say, could I produce my own sentient being through a process of artificial evolution? Because of course, if you think about it, origin of life, single cells, multicellularity, um, then transitions to different speciation to animals, um, abstraction, com communication, symbolism, culture, language, mathematics, technology. Um, and before you, you've got human beings doing quite complex things and showing intelligence, solving problems. Um, and why do human beings do that? Well, they do it presumably to come get an advantage, to survive. And is survival the only requirement to produce a general purpose problem solving machine? Because if we say that intelligence is a general purpose problem solving machine and we're not creating AIs that are motivated to be general purpose problem solving machines, then um, we might not be able to make a comparison. In fact, we might not want to because we're the, we're, the, we're the biggest threat to our own society, right? Not the AIs. The AIs are no threat at all. It's the human beings using them that is the threat. Let's be clear. The AIs don't care. There is no evidence they have any sentience. Um, the, other, the other thing I just mentioned quickly is that it's not clear to me that we want to impose our conception of awareness and intelligence on an AI. AIs may be aware and intelligent in new and weird ways that we just haven't seen yet. And there aren't no threat at all. They're just, they're just, they're just doing their thing. So, right. So our, our understanding of what AGI means might not be how it ends up becoming. You know, the AGI, once it comes about, might be very different from what we... Um... It, yeah. And that's why I think it's really important to kind of start to have a consensus around what we might be measuring. What problems is it solving? How general is it? And I just think I want to separate hype from potential, from yeah. fact. And, and when people tell me something has done this thing, like... This is current buzz right now that it, uh, and and a chat an LLM has solved some logical logically deep problem it hasn't seen before, and no, it hasn't done that. Got it. Yeah. So we're not there yet. So looking ahead, what are some of the key unanswered questions or exciting possibilities in your field that you hope to explore in the coming years? Um, I want to basically understand the mismatch between um, our understanding of physics and chemistry and what is required to produce the evolution and demystify that. I think that we're very close to building um, experimental frameworks that are going to make progress there. That's really exciting. And I think that will then lend us to start to go up to the chain of maybe actually helping people create new AIs. I mean, the AI that are making them general problem solvers. I mean, is, did chemistry solve the problem of existence? Here's a really nice thing. Did chemistry solve the problem of existence by creating biology? Because obviously the most successful chemistry on the planet that's able to persist forever right now are basically a life forms, the ribosome. So that's kind of a really profound realization for me that chemistry solved the problem of the complex existence by forming ribosomes and putting them in cells. Um, and so I think that's, we make progress there. The other thing is we'll have, we'll make progress on what, what is going on at the base of physics, but I'm a bit uncomfortable mentioning this because I'm really even further out of my expertise, but I don't think that should stop me from at least asking the problem, right? This is problem in physics and with quantum mechanics and time and determinism and entropy. Mm. And for me, none of these things hang together correctly. And 
the standard canon is that, oh no, we've solved all the problems and I can see glaring problems everywhere. So namely, um, what is it about our physical reality that gives novelty and that is in principle not predicted by physics? And can physics in principle, can, the phys can I shift the discipline of physics to accept that biology is mining novelty from the universe in a way that physics does not understand? And that presents an enormously interesting problem for physicists to say, oh, we need to come up with new explanations to solve this problem because there's this mismatch between what we think is already um, uh, solved and what is open. And right now, physics in general says, no, the Big Bang, the universe, all the possibilities are encoded in it. Um, and if you're being, you know, you can be a super determinist and take a really extreme view of one, one, one aspect of reality. You can say that there is no free will in another aspect of what physics would say. And that, you know, consciousness isn't this, this very special thing. It's just this way of integrating information and solving problems. So I would like to understand um, why current physics doesn't explain biology. And for me, Got I it. think assembly theory for chemistry provides that bridge. Could provide that bridge. Uh, Lee, I know we have 10 minutes left-ish. If I don't uh, uh, pee, I'm going to die. So I need to just really quickly. Okay. Just well, pause. Um, yeah. okay. No problem. Don't want you to die. Okay. How embarrassing. You'd think I'd be able to sit through a 60-minute you know, meeting. Uh, sometimes that happens. It's okay. You can anyway, cut it out and go back. Um, so here right. we are. So, um, yeah. so you're, you're, you're describing uh, some of the things that you hope to, to find out or to to solve and I think you're unsatisfied with physics the answer that physics provide about quantum uh, physics and physical reality and there's questions that are assumed to be answered that are just not that may be assembly theory let me ask you because you talk about novelty as an essential element of of life right only life can cr can create novelty um, you said that you're not an expert in consciousness but isn't it consciousness specifically that enables life to create novelty? Um, not specifically, because biology, you know, kind of boring, non-conscious Darwinian evolution has done quite a good job of open-endedness. I mean, I don't think consciousness was required for the evolution of the skeleton uh, teeth um, and so on. I think yeah, consciousness... Yeah, that's, yeah. That, that, that's novelty, though. Like, when you say novelty, what does novelty mean? Like, is... Oh, like, so, so novelty has, I think, is able to produce new assemblages or new objects or new new things that are in principle not predictable earlier in time. And our Darwinian evolution does do that. What, what consciousness seems to do is to accelerate that. It decouples the need for having to die in a population. So you can do things in your head. You can do the counterfactuals. You can think about it and say, maybe I'll make this rocket that can land on legs. Maybe I'll make this rocket that has wings. Maybe I'll make this rocket that does this. And you do that and you design it. So I think that biology, that Darwin evolution does solve problems, but by you having consciousness real time in your brain allows you to do things much faster. And that may be one of the primary reasons that consciousness is so important. Um, I, I've tried to propose that a couple of times, but there's a large number of people discussing this. And and what happens is you tend to get trapped in the same loop, right? Um, you know, Dan Dennett denies consciousness um, exists, I think. But uh, so, and then, you know, um, some people design, deny that free will exists and the say we're all determined. So you've got all these weird schools of thought and all I want to do is say, no, 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 let's take what we all can see happening this, that we all agree on, broad consensus on, and ask why. So I think that, you know, human brains are really good at being creative, right, in real time. Darwin and evolution is creative, but over a longer period of time. So that, that what consciousness does that Darwin evolution, that the bacteria can't do, is it's able to really act on the environment in real time and not need trial and error. And, and that's super interesting. And you mentioned free will. So does free will exist? I don't, I don't know if it's a well-posed question. 
I keep getting stuck. I have will. I have agency. Is it free? I think. Well, the very the very word agency and will it has to be free. It's in the definition. Agency is not agency without freedom of will. That's what agency is, right? So, if you're gonna, so in a way, yes. I think if the universe is doing what I think it's doing, which is kind of open ended, then um, then free will does exist in that regard. But I certainly have agency. I certainly am making decisions. But my decisions might be a function of my evolutionary baggage, the my kind of morphological baggage in my memories my current situation, what's going on in the environment, and my ability to project ahead and imagine creative solutions. So I think in a way that creativity in that way is maybe requires this thing called free will, which is why I keep trying to hold, hold on to it. You know, it makes it easier for some arguments to say, yeah, we, I do agree, you know, like uh, Sabine Hoffenstauser uh, 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 says, um, there's no free will. And her argument is really quite good. It's like she's not saying there is no ability to make decisions. She's just saying the whole free will is a bit of a category error because if I've got free will, then how much free will do you give to an electron? But I think what she's missing or what is missing in the area is that my brain is able to mine novelty from the universe as a thing and electrons don't. And why is it that my brain comprising of electrons mines novelty from the universe and electrons don't? And it's to do with a combinatorial space and the ability to do counterfactuals and the ability to have a memory and all this. So I think that um, if you were to push me and we were to be very um, sympathetic with the de definition of free will, I would say, sure, we have free will or we have problem solving creative abilities. Uh, and uh, and however you want to call that. So, so probably, maybe free will, probably. Well, I mean, if it, from what you said, it's free will. Other people might label it differently. I don't know. There's a lot of, what I know is a lot of discussions I have somewhat are, are um, kind of language problems, right? Words are a problem. Is that people get really hold on to words, but what they should really be doing is looking at the connection between those words to understand the, the 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 kind of inex so there are some things that are just inexplic inexplicit initially that you're just trying to make explicit through language and if you basically focus on the word because it triggers you in some way then it stops you having a richer discussion so yeah free will problem solving creativity they're all related you can, we can call them it we can come up with new what new word for it i suppose which would be right. um, so maybe i should not hang on the word agency and assume that it implies free will in that case yeah, I mean, I, th I like agency more than free will because it means I have some kind of internal ability to basically process information and act differently. I mean, I want one of the other things I want to do once we've solved or maybe simultaneously solving the origin of life is create objects that have an internal model and have agency. Like, like a you know, I want to make an oil, you know, take a, a dead thing and program it in such a way it's indistinguishable from a bumblebee or an ant or a firefly or some other living system that simply is able to show a degree of information processing and some degree of, of agency. I don't know if bees have a huge amount of agency, but they have some. And you think that's possible to replicate that? You also said that once we can solve the problem of the origin of life, so what, what do you think is the, the essence of the origin of life? You know, how or why or what did life come into existence out of I think. Um, it, it's literally um, it, it, the ability to persist in time. It, if you can imagine in the universe, in the universe that's kind of where there's no selection going on, everything is broken apart as quickly as it's made. So the fact that objects can exist for long periods of time means that they must be selected for by the, the environment. And so I mean, selected for by the environment, that is the battle we have to overcome, right? Is the battle that we are just always being broken apart, eroded, decomposing, Complex things have have many ways to fall apart and only one way to be put together. So you're always fighting against that problem. But when, when, when along the chain of time did that ability to be aware come all, the, all the way back, the, uh, selection acts on fundamental particles and, uh, and atoms and molecules. 
And that process allows you to build um, complexity that will persist in time. It just goes back to the foundation. That is the mechanism. So consciousness is contained within that complexity. In other words, from that complexity can arise the ability of that organism to become aware of itself. I would not say that consciousness is complained in, contained in that complexity because that makes me a panpsychist. Um, I would say that consciousness can emerge from those systems that have been evolved over time. I mean, but um, again, I don't, I'm not, I'm not against panpsychism. I was talking to uh, one of the major kind of uh, advocates for panpsychism the other day, and he convinced me his, his reasons for advocating for it, and they didn't seem silly. It just, it's just a strange framing for me. And so I need to think about it some more and work out, you know, what it gives me. Um, it's one of those things that it's not really, it's not physically, it doesn't solve a physical problem, but it solves a, a kind of potential dual problem. You know, it's a kind of mind matter thing. Who, who is this person that you spoke to? Philip Goff. Oh, oh yeah, I've heard of him. And he convinced you, huh? How do you, how do you convince he convince him? He didn't convince me that it was a th he can, but he did convince me that his reasoning was was made sense, and I was more open minded to it because I was just dismissing and say, of course, electrons can't be conscious. That's silly. And you say, no, no, no. This is the way I look at it, and 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 taught me took me through a school of thought which I thought was interesting and should not just be dismissed and you know i'm not a philosopher and philosophers do their things for very important reasons um and the border between philosophy and science is an interesting one yeah and that's a lot of what your work is doing is helping to converge those, uh, those topics. yeah i mean i think at the end of the day i want to be able to um explain you know how a ribosome can be formed by the process of selection in, in, from literally from sand to cells and um, and kind of produce, and it explains, you know, how difficult was it to get biology on Earth? How easy is it to get or difficult is it to find biology or alien life elsewhere in the universe? And then also intelligent life from that. And what is it about the universe that what lends itself to the production of intelligence in the first place? And I think it's a really interesting problem. It will help humanity understand. I think humanity doesn't really understand what a great position we're in. We're producing new technologies at an incredible rate. We're cleaning up the environment as fast as we're polluting it. We're, we're understanding, you know, a lot more about our reality and our psychology and, and all this. And, you know, I know that there are thought that, that the some people are kind of a bit miserable and think the world is horrible and we're going to die on climate change and all that, but we couldn't be, that couldn't be further from the truth. And it, it's fascinating that the generation of new knowledge to solve problems is causing humans to, to you're saying climate, climate change isn't a problem or you're saying, no, Sorry? You're, saying you're saying climate change is not, no, what? it's not a problem. You don't think climate, climate change is not a problem. Well, what I mean is it's not, it's not any different to any other problem, right? Right. Right. But, right. it's a, but, it, but, it, but it's a pro, it's a problem though, right? Because well, in the same way that nuclear power is a problem, right? If we don't have, if we basically build a load, a load of nuclear reactors without complete safety, they would blow up, potentially blow up, right? But um, we're not on, but we're not on track to do that. Like there's nothing. Well, but we're not on track. So the problem we have with climate change right now is the models are these these models which are not correct are being used to kind of tell us how bad we are. Let me let me frame it another way, right? Um, who are we to deny uh, some people in the world right now the right to eat? So if you're going to say right now, we're going to stop carbon, we're going to go carbon zero tomorrow, and then we'll say, all right, which three billion people do you want to starve? Because we, we need to produce uh, ammonia for fertilizer, right? Then and, then and then there's all these behavioral things going on. So it's a competition. It's always been the same competition. You go back to any technology. It's a competition between the damage you do. Hey, what, what, what's the, what's the point about? And I, I've been so looking forward to meeting to talk to meeting someone as intelligent as yourself who who doesn't think climate change is a problem. I know we're running out of time here, too. But I I I, I am. Uh, do you have another fifteen yeah, minutes? Yeah, 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 sure. Um, uh, so, so what what is your sorry? What what was the point you're making about? people starving what was the relevance there so well, because, i i, I want to because without like uh sort of we're talking about climate change and then we're sort of talking 
inferring based on that of, well, we like have to burn. We are, I feel like you're conflating this a solution with whether the problem is a problem. I'm, I'm saying like, j just focus squarely on like, is climate change a, a problem? And then what does that have to do with people uh, starving? Uh, right. Is climate change a problem? If uh, it is a problem in that if the temp average temperature of the planet goes up and some areas become uninhabitable, then there won't be enough space, right? And also, if um, the, the climate becomes unpredictable, it's going to cause problems if we don't have the technology. That's one thing. So sure, it's a problem, but hang on a second. How do we create that problem? We create that problem by burning fossil fuels, right? That's where climate change comes from, fossil fuel burning. Let's focus on that. Right now, we're saying to everyone, oh, climate change is a problem. Let's just stop burning fossil fuel. OK, if you stop burning fossil fuel, um, how well, do you so I, actually, I disagree with that, like that premise. So I, I don't think they're saying climate change is a problem with stop burning fossil fuel. I, well, I, I think so not burning fossil fuel, the decision of whether or not to burn fossil fuel doesn't have anything to do with the question of is climate change a problem? It has everything to do with a, po a possible solution for climate change. And I think we could debate what, what solution is the right one. If a solution is going to kill a lot of people, we probably shouldn't do that solution. That's, that what, I'm, that's what I'm getting at. That doesn't negate that isn't that wouldn't negate or or affect in any way whether or not climate change is a problem, right? It would just well, be a solution. We so we don't know how much of a problem climate change is, number one, right? Well, let me just try and get to the point I'm making about starvation. We have to yeah. burn a lot of fossil fuel right now to produce hydrogen to make ammonia. Lots and lots and lots. I think maybe a quarter of the emissions are just for food. And then another quarter of the emissions are probably for agriculture, right? So what I'm saying is like, there's a lot of emissions baked in for our population. Over time, we will be able to replace that, right? The, the chat, the, but this right now, this insistence that we need to go to net zero by 2050 is insane because we can't do it, right? It, there's, there's, there's no technology that's going to replace fossil fuel on that time scale. Zero. That's it. But Fantasy. And just to clarify something you did, I think, say a few minutes ago, you're saying that climate change is a problem to the extent that it would cause the, the world to heat up and cause other problems, right? So you're not, just to be clear, you're not refuting the stance that climate change is a problem. You're just saying that the solution to that problem or the proposed solution is a bad one. And it's not I really- I would say safe. two things. I would say that climate change appears to be a problem as posed in the- but I don't know how bad it's going to be because I don't know what the models really mean. The sun could cool down in a few years. It could go through a quiet phase and we all would have gone into a, into a, into a mini ice age. Right. We don't know that we have but no, probably there's no evidence of that though. I mean, probably we well, wouldn't. there is evidence. There was a mini ice age a few, about a hundred years ago. And what are the chances going to happen in the next? But exactly. Exactly. That is the question. What are the chances the climate models are correct? And what does that mean at the extent? We have well, what are the chances that every climate model is incorrect? Because they all point to the same. Uh, quite high, because they all use the same underlying assumptions. Oh. But I, I, so, I mean, Am I willing to bet $100 trillion of future productivity and growth? And get to, all I'm saying is I want to get to new technologies to solve problems rather than to imagine problems that aren't yet here. Is climate change a problem right now? No. Who is dying through climate change every year? Look, if you look at the numbers, more people, the standard of living for humanity is going up and up and up and up and up. And we're saying climate change is a problem. Who's it a problem for? Who's dying? They're saying, well, they're saying that over the course of the last few hundred years, the climate has only fluctuated a little bit. And what all these studies from all over the world show is that in the last however many 50, 100 years, it's, it's gone up exponentially. Yeah, in the last few hundred years, the amount of compute has been really low. And then suddenly in the last yeah, yeah. 70 years, it went doom. Right. Right. What's I mean, I, I, I mean, look, I would like to uh, be precautionary. And of course, if we can stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere the rate we are, we should stop. But uh, but what's happening right now is that people are being does all this decision. We're talking about agency, right? Humanity's decision making is kind of built it, baked in. Right. <laughs> like we've got this industrial technologies. We've got this footprint. And we've got to find a sustainable way. And this, I mean this in the real me meaning. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a race in technology. In, the, in Victorian England at the Industrial Revolution, it was a mess. There was smog everywhere. 
air quality was awful. Over time, that was improved. I'm hoping the same type of thing will happen with advanced technologies. I think we need to burn more fossil fuel right now to get to technological solutions, fusion and things like that faster rather than to say, oh, no, we should feel guilty and not burn fossil fuel or travel and eat meat and all that stuff. I think that's nonsensical. But you can you can believe both that we should burn fossil fuels because of all the practical reasons you gave without discrediting you know, these, these finding and research that climate change is a thing and is a problem. And, and it feels like you've gone back, you, you know, on one hand you say it is no, a problem. I'm not saying, look, I'm, I'm not saying no, climate change isn't happening. It's clearly happening. Right. Is it a problem? Well, problem in what sense? Like problems here and now? I think that- what, Well, yeah, if, if we look at the numbers, uh, right? The numbers are saying is that it will be a, a problem. So you're, so I guess you're, you're agreeing- You can't predict that. the future. That's the problem. The human beings have singly been unable. So there's two routes. All I'm trying to say is opportunity cost. I'm kind of like, so just for the record, I'm not denying, cl denying climate change. There's unequivocal evidence the planet is warming up. My question is- At a rate that's, at a rate that's uniquely fast. That exactly. Only... Completely. Is so, that really a problem though? Right? So- But wait, but, but you're agreeing that it's increasing at a rate. So wouldn't, wouldn't you agree that it's going to continue to increase at the rate suggested by the model? No idea. There could be a volcanic explosion that puts a shit ton of- but there's, probably not, but there's probably not going to be that. I mean, well, how do we know? Why can't we trust? The, so I guess why can't we trust the models? Like, I don't know much about it. I want a model that tells me when all the volcanic... Act, so I'd like a model of the solar system that tells me the sun, the sun activity for the next 100 years, which rock volcanoes are going to explode, and, and so on and so forth. It's just like we, we are basically holding ourselves hostage to some models, and we don't know the cost of... There's a, It's about cost and opportunity. That's that, all. But I, but I feel like you're conflating because the... I agree that the opportunity cost could be very high, but why do we have to uh, argue against the like the data that's suggesting the climate? Why can't we have it both ways? Why can't we say, look, the data is there, climate is increasing, it's not good, it's probably not good, um, but there's no good solutions today because we're not about to cut out fossil fuels. Well, why does it have to be that because you don't agree with the solution, because you know that uh, cutting out fossil fuels is going to be harmful, that that therefore let's really call into question all these um, you know these studies. I, I'm not calling into question studies. I'm saying they're not predictive, right? I'm saying I don't know what's going to happen, number one. In fact, I, if I was really going to double down and be annoying, I would say probably the amount of greenery on planet Earth goes up. The amount of accessible land goes up. It's just a human toil, human migration from one part of the planet to another is very expensive, right? I mean, you look at the graph. Yeah, the graph's going up. I mean, the temperature's going up. Yeah, but there's not, it's so sure. But it's, it's and then you're saying, what if, what if there's a glacier that comes from Neptune and it hits the Earth and it cools it down? I'm, it not, I'm not saying that. I'm saying the balance of probabilities. The climate change models mm -hmm. are, it, it's, it's a very hard science. What I would say, all I'm trying to say is one important thing. We should not minimize our opportunities to solve problems through fear of problems that haven't yet materialized, number one. And let's remove the conflation. I think if we can find a way to maximize our ability to build technologies and get access to energy, um, whilst knowing that we should bring the amount of carbon use down, 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 that's totally fantastic. I'm which, means that you, which means that you do want to bring it down. I think nice. it, would, it would be, given the knowledge we have right now, we've been putting, putting a pollutant into the atmosphere for the last 200 years, it would be unwise to continue to keep doing that because we don't know what's going to happen. So you agree? So you agree it's not a good thing that... that, that yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not a but human... It's, but it's also not a good thing to stop human progress. For sure. But that's and, the solution. And, that's, that has nothing to do with the problem. But it, you're right. That is a bad solution. That would cost and, uh, and all I'm saying is we should stop fear I mean, I mean, I think... Greenpeace, right, I ironically have done more for climate change acceleration than any other organization. It's so annoying because, you know, look at the fact we could have had nuclear power over all of Europe by now. Yeah. Right. And then we just don't. And so but one thing I, I mean, uh, one thing we should agree on is that we need access to, to increasing amounts of energy without the environmental consequences. In the end, we'll probably take our industrial uh, co complex off Earth and have it into orbit. That's a long way away, right? If you took all yeah. the industri heavy industry off Earth and had it in orbit, it would be cool, yeah. literally. I mean, think about all these data centers and all this AI, how much is contributing to global warming? 
Like, that would be amazing. That would I be mean, amazing. You think, if, you know, so I think, so I'm saying very critically, I don't want to be bullied emotionally into one decision rather than another. I want to understand how I have maximum opportunity to build technology because as a problem solver, as a technologist, I believe building technology fast will give us options to solve problems as they arise rather than that worry about problems that are not that yet here. Well, and, and I think, and let me know, if, uh, here, let, let me try to encapsulate what you've said and, and please edit me if I'm wrong, is that yes, climate change is trending in a uncomfortable direction, could cause problems for us. However, this the, the suggestion that we should cut out fossil fuels will absolutely cause more pain immediately than climate change ever could. And therefore, right. therefore, if we're going to address climate change, which we should, we've got to find a we've got to find a better way. And maybe with not as much sense of urgency, but maybe the sense of urgency is also the same sense of urgency, but empowering people to think about consumption. So it's a bit like it's a race of resource, right? I see it that we've got this level of technology. It's a bit like going from the weaving looms to the, the first digital computers and from digital computers to the next level of technology. It's like, what is the maximum we can get away with using? before we have to make the leap to the next technological stage, right? So it's like, so all I'm saying, right, and to be absolutely crystal clear, is to say, if we can burn more fossil fuel in the next 10 years and get to fusion, which will allow us to basically, you know, dramatically reduce carbon use over the next 100 years, rather than slowly just get, go down fossil fuel and not get to the technological use, we're not going to have the scope to solve more pro all these extra problems. So it's like it's a critical balance, and I think that that's all I'm saying. I'm no climate change denier. I'm just saying, a, is it such a big problem? How many extra people are dying every year because right now? And what is the cost versus the cost of the? Uh, um, what is the cost of not developing new technologies um, and just conserving? Right. And, yep. you know, the people that are thinking they're having a negative impact on the world and they should not eat meat and they shouldn't wear clothes and all this stuff should just go and live in a cave. That's completely wrong. All of history has shown that wrong. The Enlightenment, since the Enlightenment, our quality of life has got better and better and better and better and better. And so the question is, how do we increase our quality of life and not mess up the planet? That's what yeah. we have to do. I, and I wish more people could take your stance in recognizing the challenge, like, and also, you know, being able, being willing to debate the solutions, which may be bad solutions, without calling into question the problem itself. It's, also, it's all about incentives as well, right? Because the fossil yeah. fuel incentives are huge, right? And how do you shift human beings? Again, Sabine Hofstadter, who I talked about earlier, did a really good thing on climate change and free will, and which explained that basically human human tendencies are baked in. We've got, I think, many generations ahead to change our tendencies, right? Our requirements. We, it's not about that we all could wake up tomorrow and stop climate change. That would be impossible because we all have to stop eating and stop traveling and stop doing anything. So it's, you know, it's a bit about understanding. And this comes back to we do have free will and agency. We do do these things. Let's think about the consequences of those things. Let's come up with new solutions. And I think that's going to be really exciting. And we need to put it in context because right now humanity Sure, there's too, many, too much war. There's too much geopolitical animosity, which I want to get, you know, if I could like, wars could dial down a bit, geopolitical animosity could go down a bit, and we could also realize it's all in our- I mean, it's over time it's been doing much better, you know? Yeah, that's it. And right now it doesn't look good, but over the last 100, 200 years- it's and, and exactly, and I'm just saying that we are getting better. And I don't, you know, I'm not qualified. I'm sure after you, you publish this, there'll be people telling me what all the, all the statistics are for, for you know, climate change and how many deaths there have been in the last year because a load of people have drowned or something. But, but you're like, not denying it. You're just saying the proposed solution is a terrible solution. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I, I think one of the other things I thought was interesting is the fact that climate change seems to accelerate in the past few years because we've cleaned up the atmosphere so much. We're taking all these, all these small particles out of the atmosphere, all the pollutants, and suddenly the temperature's gone up a bit because it's not reflecting the sun's rays. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure that if we really needed an urgent solution, we would be able to do something and we might end up putting a, a load of sulfate into the atmosphere, right? Like to simulate a volcanic explosion that could bring the planet, planet the temperature down within two years, one or two degrees. Now, wow. what effect would that do if you had a small volcanic winter 
what would that do to other things? You know, would it affect the sea? Would it affect the coral? Would it, you know, and then we like do that. And then we like, oh shit, we've done that. We should do that. What's the other thing we need to do? Oh, we'll do that. You know, <laughs> but the right. planet's quite big. And I, I think that, you know, we, we just have to, we have, we are terraforming the planet. That's what I'm trying to say. Since the origin of life, an origin of life polluted the planet before, and there was no damn oxygen change deniers out there, you know? When photosynthesis started, <laughs> there was this huge, the, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere went from, you know, low percent to 20%. And it caused a mass extinction event. Yeah. So, yeah, let's, let's prevent, let's not have that happen again, right? Well, no, it, look at all what happened. It, do we they, want, do, there was an, do, do it want cleared out all the niche and all this extra stuff was going to, went on. Do we want know? an extinction event though? I think extinction is not a bad thing. For humans? I mean, Matt, do you... Well, I mean, like, for, you want to... In biology, you prune niches and things grow, right? And things happen. I mean, you know... So do you want... I mean, would it... You're not opposed to a mass extinction extension of humans? I would... I, I don't want to die. I don't want the human, human race to die. I don't want technology to die. I'm just saying, when things go extinct, it's not the tragedy that the environmentalists say... I think what if it's humans go extinct? What if the world temperature continues to increase in, until you know in seventy-five years the average temperature is one hundred twenty degrees Fahrenheit, which makes it untenable for humans? That would not be good, right? We we will not get there. We will do something to stop that. That's my point. It's like yeah. as soon as it's I mean, right now, what I'm trying to say, what's critical? I don't know this. How much damage is being done right now through climate change? How many people is it affecting, and how do we stop that? Right. That's. That's the way you do it. It's like people live in Arizona. I've just been there. They have they have air conditioning, you know. And yeah. if energy is infinitely cheap and everyone got air conditioning, no problem. It'd be as hot as you want, you know. When you get these wet bulb events, maybe in Asia, where literally people could project millions of people could die, we don't want that to happen. We don't even want to do that experiment. So there's kind of you know thinking about these catastrophic events. Do they happen? How do you prevent them? And then also kind of doing it with proportionality with regards to the number of resources we have available. Because if we knew that Yellowstone was going to erupt, if Yellowstone erupts in the next thousand years, it probably does a big damage to the, the US, right? How do we how do we how do we force how do we foresee that and stop it? It's a bit like the Fukushima earth, the earthquake in Japan that caused Fukushima. If we knew about that beforehand, we wouldn't stop the earthquake, but we maybe might have stopped the nuclear reactor losing power. No. You know, what people feel now is, hey, they're they're saying, hey, we're predicting that Yellowstone is going to erupt. That's that's kind of the equivalent of what they're saying. They're saying that Yellowstone yeah, yeah. Is so it's about understanding towards us. That's it's about understanding that, and I'm just saying, you know, yeah. pe people kind of frame it in a way that makes it sensationalist. Of course, I, my hope is that we will get fusion quickly. We'll remove, we'll actually use fusion energy to remove CO2 from the atmosphere over time, and we'll move heavy industry off Earth. And Earth, yeah. you know, and Earth is a, will be a, will just get cleaner. It's easy. Move it off Earth. Yeah. Well, a Starship works. Yeah. It means you got to get a whole thing. It looks like it's dark over there where you are. And I know you're jet lagged. Yeah. Why don't I um, let let us wrap up? Because um, I, I could keep talking to you for another couple hours, but let me let me respect your, your time here um, and the amount of time. That I said I'd take, so I, I appreciate it. Let me end this recording, Lee, and then maybe you and I could wrap up for like two minutes. If that's sure. works for you. Um, uh, okay. Uh, 